Good evening. My name is Michael Zank, and I welcome you to the third annual Yitzhak Rabin Memorial Lecture at Boston University. Uh, I'm the director of the Elie Wiesel Center for Jewish Studies, and we are the hosting uh, institution here at Boston University. I'm pleased to host tonight's event commemorating the 20th anniversary of the assassination of the Prime Minister of Israel. I'm also pleased that each and every one of tonight's participants has volunteered their time to pay homage to uh, Itzhak Rabin and express their concern for peace in the Middle East. Before telling you more about tonight's event, let me recognize Mr. Jonathan Crevin, who graduated from the College of Arts and Sciences. <laughs> who graduated from the College of Arts and Sciences in 1972. Those were heady days when Israel's victory uh, in the Six Day War was still on everybody's mind and the Yom Kippur War that uh, brought back Israel's vulner vulnerability was still a, a year in the future. Uh, in planning and preparing for tonight, Jonathan was my inspiration and my gadfly. It was his idea to try to recruit President Clinton. I thought that was impossible. When I mentioned this to Elie Wiesel and Marianne Wiesel at my last visit in June, Elie said, that'll, that won't be a problem. <laughs> he said. So I kept on trying, and tonight I can report that Ellie was right and Jonathan prevailed. In the middle of tonight's program, we will share a two-minute exclusive video message from President Clinton. And I thank you, Jonathan, for your care and your resolve and your energy and your generosity of spirit. We would not be here tonight without you. I would like to thank our team, foremost among them, Elie Wiesel Center Program Administrator, Dr. Teresa Cooney, and, <laughs> and Laurie Covens, our uh, Communications Director. Without, Teresa, uh, without Teresa's indefatigable attention to hundreds of details and Laurie's professionalism in reaching out to so many people, we would not be here either, especially not so many of us. In a few minutes, we will have the privilege of hearing from Professor Ephraim Inbar, the director of the Begin Sadat Center for Security Studies at Bar Ilan University, who knew Itzhak Rabin well, and who will speak about the prospects for peace today, 20 years after the assassination. Following the video by President Clinton, we will convene a panel of distinguished experts to discuss the legacy of Oslo. The panel will be moderated by the one and only Tom Ashbrook, of host of On Point. <laughs> and our panelists include Andy Basevich, former chair and professor of international relations at Boston University, David Ellenson, the new director of Israel studies at Brandeis University, Susanna Heschel, uh, professor of Jewish Studies at Dartmouth College, and Boston Globe columnist Jeff, Jeff Jacoby. Our event should conclude by 9 o'clock, after which I hope you will all stay for the reception right outside in the hall. Now, before I invite uh, the representative of the State of Israel to New England, Mr. Yudha Yaakov, to the stage, let me say a few more words. Our heart goes out to the victims of the current round of violence, Jews and Arabs, Israelis and Palestinians. We must ask ourselves whether this and prior rounds of violence that have struck Israel and Palestine would have occurred or could have been avoided had the Oslo Accords concluded 22 years ago between Israel and the Palestinian Liberation Organization been implemented? 
We will never know the answer to this question because the implementation of Oslo was disrupted not by the Hamas terror that was raging then, but by the assassination of Prime Minister Rabin at the hands of someone whom the lead investigator at the time called a good Jew. The choices of the past are not the choices of the present. We must confront, confront the choices of today, but we will do well to remember Yitzhak Rabin and consider what motivates the opposition from within the Jewish-Israeli community to the idea of Oslo, to the formula, formula of land for peace, to the possibility of Jewish-Arab coexistence in Israel, and to the principle of two states for two people. It is time to reconsider Rabin, who was not a perfect man, and Oslo, which was not a perfect agreement, but a step in the direction of a two-state solution and a diplomatic, mutually agreed, negotiated settlement of this conflict between the people of Palestine and the Jewish state, whose right to exist is beyond dispute. Tonight's event is not just a commemoration, but a debate. It is not just about the past, but about the future. The future of the State of Israel, of the Jewish community at large, and of those in the United States who support Israel and are thinking about U.S. involvement in the Middle East more generally. In considering Israel, we have a choice between two starkly different visions of what it means to be a Zionist, an Israeli, a Jew, or a non-Jewish American supportive of Israel. One of these choices is represented by Yitzhak Rabin, a man committed to a strong, a strong Jewish and democratic state who saw, as we know now, the religious settler movement as a cancer on the body politic of the Jewish state. The other one is represented by Yigal Amir, a good Jew, who represents commitment to the redemption of the land of Israel as a Jewish duty. We have a debate tonight that I hope will help us understand better what this choice is all about and what it entails. I now invite the representative of the state of Israel Mr. Yudha Yaakov, to the podium to say a few words. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Um, and I guess I don't have to avoid being political in my brief opening remarks. Yitzhak <laughs> Rabin, um, the late Israeli Prime Minister, is different things for different people. And I think it's fair to say that as we commemorate 20 years to his assassination, um, each of us look to his legacy and find something different and essentially create in our own minds what we think his legacy should be. And this is particularly true in challenging times, such as this. We can see this um, in the Israeli discourse in the last few weeks in the Israeli press. To me, particularly in these challenging times, Yitzhak Rabin's legacy was represented by a combination of our need to strive for peace with our neighbors while remaining strong. Rabin was, on the one hand, for coexistence. By the way, not only coexistence between Israel and the Palestinians, but coexistence within Israel as well, which I would venture to say is an important component of our long-term cohesiveness and sustainability together with our ability to defend ourselves by ourselves and of course our strategic partnership with the United States. But Yitzhak Rabin was also about our historical affinity to the land. And as we commemorate 20 years to his assassination, I find it pertinent to recall his comment at uh, the remarks he made at the 1994 Nobel Peace Prize acceptance ceremony, and I quote, I am here as the emissary of Jerusalem at whose gates I fought in the days of siege. Jerusalem, which has always been and is today 
the eternal capital of the state of Israel, and the heart of the Jewish people, who pray toward it three times a day. I find these words particularly potent today, as in the last 24, 48 hours, we have seen an attempt within the chaos that envelops our region, an attempt by the Palestinians and some of our Arab neighbors to have a UN body declare the Wailing Wall, the Western Wall, to be a Muslim heritage site, a shrine. That proposal was withdrawn at the last minute, but the decision that was adopted today recognized the tomb of Isaac, Jacob, Leah, and Rachel as not being Jewish shrines. And so, when I look back at Robin's legacy, I can only reach one conclusion, that whatever he intended in his hesitant handshake with Yasser Arafat, that UNESCO resolution is not what he intended. Robin was an incurable optimist when it comes to Israel's future, as am I. And I draw inspiration from that optimism. Coexistence in Israel and between Israel and the Palestinians must prevail in Jerusalem as throughout the Middle East. Mutual respect must be accompanied both by maintaining the status quo to which Israel is committed and accepting thousands of years of Judaism's historic affinity to the land. We have nothing to be ashamed about. That, to me, is also Robin's legacy. I apologize that I won't be able to stay tonight because I have to leave here for another event. But before I leave, and as a reflection of the our commitment at the Israeli Consulate to New England to Robin's legacy. I want to make sure all you know, and I, I was assured I could plug my own event here. On November 6th at Hebrew College in Newton, at 8.30 in the morning, we're going to have what I hope to be a very large uh, commemoration of Robin's legacy, Shalom Chaver, uh, at which uh, Congressman Kennedy will speak. He will speak on his personal reflections. Moshe Safdi, the world-renowned architect, will share his own personal experiences. He knew Robin personally. And uh, you're invited. You just have to register in advance. Space is limited. Thank you very much. Have a successful event. I now invite uh, Professor Inbar to the podium for his lecture. Good evening, shalom to everybody. Uh, before I uh, delve into uh, Rabin's approach to peacemaking and uh, the analysis of what's happening today, uh, allow me to say a personal note. In June 1967, I was a young soldier savoring the great victory. I, like many of my contemporaries, admired my commander in chief. We sang, Nasser Mechakele Rabin, Nasser is waiting for Rabin. I'm not very good at carrying a tune, so I'll not do it to you. <laughs> we sang, Yerushalayim Shal Zahav. My admiration gradually transformed into more adult and sober appreciation of the man, his great analytical qualities, his weaknesses, and his middle-of-the-road political views. This led in Teralia to my first serious academic endeavor, a PhD dissertation at the University of Chicago, which focused on the national security policies of Yitzhak Rabin, first government, 74 to 77. During the research for my dissertation, Rabin was in the political wilderness, an opposition backbencher, 
and I was fortunate enough to meet him and investigate his views at length. He has been an object of my professional attention since. As part of my study of various aspects of Israel's national security predicament, Rabin was a very reserved person, shy. He didn't look into my eyes. But through my research, I felt that I acquired a certain familiarity with this man, his views, and the nuances of his complex personality. My hero of the Six-Day War turned into an object of serious academic research. Rabin commanded my respect. I liked him, like many Israelis. He was not the usual politician. Can you imagine a politician that cannot lie? <laughs> he was one of them. Many years after 67, which precipitated many of Israel's contemporary security dilemmas, Rabin was murdered by a right-wing fanatic. Bewildered at the tragedy and not fully clear about its meaning for my society, I was left, as many others, to wonder what happened to my sense of elation and unity of 1967. Rabin's sad removal from the political stage also ended my familiarity with one of Israel's foremost leaders. He was a towering figure. The deep personal loss felt by my countrymen and so acutely by myself led me to pay tribute to Rabin in the best way academicians know, writing about him. With Rabin, a veteran of the War of Independence, gone, a change of guard has taken place in Israel's leadership. The new leaders belong to a new generation. Since 67, Israel underwent many social and political changes. It also improved relations with several Arab neighbors, which were once intent on destroying it. With Yitzhak Rabin gone, an epoch has ended for Israel, as well as for my research agenda. I think that Rabin's approach to peacemaking is not enough well known. Um, he believed that transition to peace is a long historic process. What you need in order to gain peace is military superiority. Military superiority is a necessary but not sufficient condition for making peace. The 90s, in which he was prime minister, were a positive strategic environment for him. First of all, there was unipolarity. The Cold War ended with Soviet Union disintegrating, not able to help Israel's enemies. The regional foes were destroyed, Iraq, by the Americans. Syria was intimidated. The PLO was weak because it sided with Saddam Hussein in the first Gulf War. Egypt was out of the conflict because it had peace, a peace treaty with Israel, which Rabin viewed as an interim agreement. He really didn't believe that it's going to hold on for long. And Jordan, of course, was a strategic partner. In addition, he felt that Israel was strong also because of the Russian immigration. Over a million Russian Jews came to Israel, strengthening the state in many ways. Second, we should recognize that Rabin did not seek peace as a value. It was not a core value for Rabbi. What he wanted, it was security. Maximum security constitutes true peace. This is what he said, I'm quoting. He was a sober realist, a conservative, quite pessimist about the international arena. Even after peace treaties, Israel, in his opinion, needed a strong army. He coined the term dormant war, meaning Israel is in a situation of dormant war. 
a war is waking up every few years. He understood that peace treaties are a piece of paper, and circumstances can change. The deal with the Palestinians was not territory for peace. The deal with the Palestinians was territory for security. And he made sure that Arafat will get all the tools he needed. And he insisted on the Palestinians having a strong police, it was called, with no Supreme Court of Justice and no Bezalem, no human rights organization. This I quote Rabbi, because he wanted a dictator able to prevent terrorism from the Palestinian territories. But the Arafat calls for jihad, the refusal to extradite terrorists, as it was written in the Oslo agreements, the refusal to annul offensive clauses in the PLO charter created great ambivalence in Rabin to the whole process. The Israeli intelligence gave low marks to Arafat's rule. Yalon, in his uh, memoirs, says it, writes that uh, it was in September, end of September, 95, he came to Rabin and told him, listen, those guys are not preparing for peace. They are preparing for war. And Rabin typically said, we'll see and wait. He was a patient guy. And he said specifically, we'll wait for the elections of January 96, and then we'll decide what to do. By the way, he confided his lack of satisfaction with the process to Eli Wiesel, that the center is named after. And I read it. He was not happy with what was happening. Rabin even publicly said, Arafat is not serious. We don't know what would have happened if he wouldn't have been murdered. But there is also a chance that Rabin, the gingy, the red hair guy, would have kicked back Arafat to Tunis. Dalia Rabin, his daughter, said that this was a clear possibility. Rabin was obviously ready for territorial concessions. He was in favor of the partition of the land of Israel because this was mainstream Zionism. But, as was mentioned before, Rabin wanted a united Jerusalem. Rabin was very emotional about Jerusalem. He was born in Jerusalem. In 48, his brigade fought in Jerusalem and in the area around it. And he saw the fact that he was the liberator of Jerusalem in 1967, a great privilege. Historic justice for him. He also wanted the journal rift, of course. He basically was an alone plan man. Most Israelis, then and now, are ready for territorial concessions. There is no vision of Igal Amir in Israel. This is not a few crazy guys. This is not part of mainstream Israel, despite what people say in Boston. Rabin went for the process with the Palestinians also because it was a gradual process. Uh, he was Kissingerian, a conservative. Step by step, this was his philosophy of making peace with the Arabs because you can check at every stage if the other side fulfills his, its part of the agreement. Of course, the Oslo agreement also appealed to him because there was no stated goal of having a Palestinian state which he opposed. He believed that Oslo was reversible. There was an article there. Nobody paid attention to it. He did. Article 5.4 of the 
which says permanent settlement does not affect, is not affected by the interim agreements. I must say, from what I know of Rabi, the disbelief was very incongruous with Rabin's cautious, pragmatic, pessimistic nature. Um, by the way, we really don't know what his goal was. His colleagues in the party um, were complaining to him. Where are we going? Particularly the hawkish. But even Yossi Bailey, in his book writes, once he gave him a piece of paper, part of the agreement, and next morning Rabin told him it's okay, and Yossi Balin says in his book, for what I know of Rabin, I don't understand how he approved it. He was not clear. He, uh, he preferred not to talk about the too distant future. He was very pragmatic. Let's see what's happened today and tomorrow. There was also an important time vector which brought him into the process. He was generally ready to wait until the Arabs will accept Israeli terms. All peace now, Mashiach now, all, he detested this type of now In 90s, however, he displayed a sense of urgency similar to the dovish wing in his party. He identified early the Islamist surge in the Middle East the spreading of political Islam, radical political Islam in the Middle East. And he also identified early the danger of nuclear proliferation from Iran. Iran actually was the two, Islamic radicalism and nuclear proliferation. He hoped to prevent those development or to mitigate their effect by having peace with the neighbors. Moreover, Rabin in the 90s had a negative evaluation of Israel's, of the ability of the Israeli society to withstand protracted conflict. He uh, criticized the Israeli society during the missile attacks in 1991 for running away. There were many people that left Tel Aviv. Uh, for many others, it was a rational uh, option. Why should I stay where missiles are coming down? He was patriotic. He said, we have to, to be there. He, he juxtaposed the situation to the uh, German attacks on, on Tel Aviv during World War, I, World War II. So this was an additional impetus for him uh, going to, to Oslo to uh, accept a Palestinian partner who, which he was always very suspicious of. We should also remember that Rabin achieved peace with Jordan in 1994. It's of course a reflection of the ongoing strategic commonality between Jordan and Israel for decades. Rabin was successful in capitalizing on the international constellation at that time to bring Hussein to the negotiating table and sign in public a peace treaty with Israel. And Jordan is important. Jordan has the longest border with Israel. It's the closest to the heartland of Jerusalem. I live in Jerusalem. The heartland, the triangle, Tel Aviv, Haifa, Jerusalem, this is, this is Israel. They are just 20 kilometers away, 15 miles in your measurements. Of course, uh, Rabin felt much more comfortable in the company of Hussein, King Hussein, than with Arafat that he initially detested. He said, the most difficult time, the hardest hand to shake was Arafat. But the peace process with the Palestinians, as we all know, ended in failure. There were attempts 
by uh, Israeli leaders later on to salvage the process. Prime Minister Ehud Barak in year 2000 came to the United States, had a meeting with Arafat, came David, made incredible concessions, particularly if we speak about Rabin's standards. Rabin would never agree to this type of concessions. Afterwards, Ehud Olmert from another party with the Likud heritage. In 2007, again, offered even more concessions, which were not accepted by the Palestinians. And unfortunately, the peace process has failed, and no comprehensive agreement was attained. The clear lesson of, Pro, of, Pro, of Oslo, which most Israeli agree, and in this respect I'm mainstream. The insight is that we cannot have peace with the Palestinians in the near future. There is no chance whatsoever for the two-state solution, which I would love to have. Actually, Oslo was an attempt to impose a statist rationale on the Palestinian national movement. States behave differently than gangs, but it didn't work. What are the reasons? One, there is no chance for historical compromise between the Zionist movement and the Palestinian national movement because the gap between the position is just too large. Many people say, oh, we all know what will be the result, the Clinton parameters. Forget about it. The Clinton parameters will not be expected, accepted by Israel. No Israeli government will survive the Clinton parameters. And the Palestinians said what they think about those parameters. They said, no. Jerusalem is an issue which cannot be easily solved. There is the issue of refugees. It's the Jordan Rift, which is critical to Israel's security, particularly when we see the chaos in the Middle East. And since year 2000, Barak, Prime Minister of Labor, from Labor, coined a mantra that everybody agrees with. Everybody, you know, not every old Jews can agree, but uh, <laughs> most of it, most of them. There is no partner. We have no partner. And we have no partner even in a deeper sense. This is not a territorial conflict. Palestinians are not ready to lend legitimacy to Jewish nationalism. Israel recognized the Palestinian legitimate rights already in 1978 by Menachem Begin. There is no recognition on their part. They are not willing to see a Jewish state next to them. It's a fact, fair complete maybe, but to give a normative acceptance, the, it's no. They deny our rights to the Temple Mount. As long as a Jewish presence on the Temple Mount will be seen as a provocation, there's not going to be peace. This understanding dawned even on the Israeli left. Shlomo Avineri, Professor Shlomo Avineri, Mori Rabbi, in an article in Haaretz, the outlet of the Israeli left, a few weeks ago, said those things. No, it's not going to work. They are not willing to see a Jewish state next to them. By the way, the growing influence of radical Islam in the region definitely is not going to make the Palestinians more moderate. Hamas becomes stronger, not weaker. A second reason is that the Palestinians display, not surprisingly, an inability to build a state. What they have achieved, it's a failed state. 
a state, according to a Weberian definition, is a political entity with a monopoly over use of force. There is no monopoly over use of force in Palestine because there are militias. And the Palestinian Authority lost control over part of its territory to one militia, Hamas, in Gaza. And even in Gaza, there is no monopoly over use of force. Because we have Hamas, Islamic Jihad, ISIS, clans with weapons. This, by the way, reflects a larger phenomenon in the Arab world. The Arab world, as we see it in front of our eyes, is unable to maintain statist structures. And the whole statist structure in the Middle East is falling apart. There is no Iraq, no Syria, no Libya, no Yemen. Lebanon is not a country, not a state. They have a militia, Hezbollah, and a national army, which is afraid of the militia. So the Palestinians are not that different from their Arab cousins. Moreover, if the world thinks that it, will, it can build a Palestinian state, it is very wrong. There is no real ability for political engineering by Western powers in the Middle East. And I think you know it very well from your tragic experience in Iraq or in Afghanistan of all places. You tried courageously to build in Iraq in your own image. It doesn't work. Even if we'll have a Marshall Plan for the Palestinians, it will not work. The money is transferred. Do not filter down. They're siphoned by a corrupt leadership. And Israel is not against it. We don't want hungry neighbors. Europeans want to pay for it. Faddal, go ahead. Americans are sending millions of dollars to the Palestinians. We are not going to object. Also, it's not entirely clear that the Palestinians really want a state. They missed two historic waves of state building. One in 48, you know, India became independent. Israel became independent, same year, the, the beginning of the decolonization process. And they, they were not interested in that state. They wanted to destroy the Jewish state. In the 90s, we had another historic wave. When the Soviet Union um, crumbled down. And then we had Oslo. But they did not capitalize on the great opportunity to have a state. A state means responsibility. A state means giving up the victimum, victimhood ethos. They are in love with the idea of being the victims of the Jews. And finally, this is probably the most important reason why we will not have peace anytime soon, is because the two societies still have energies to fight. Believe me, no nice package coming from Washington or coming from any foreign ministry will do the trick. Ethno-religious conflicts do not end easily. I was in Athens one day. They also asked me, uh, why don't you finish the conflict? And I asked them, how many years did you fight the Turks? <laughs> I knew the answer. Several hundred years. Comparatively, we are a young conflict. And it is not funny. That's the truth. Moreover, Israel has displayed great social resilience. In this respect, Rabin was wrong. Rabin would have been surprised by how the Israeli society is able to withstand the conflict with Hezbollah, with Hamas. Israelis can be proud of themselves.
So what is Rabin's legacy? Uh, I must say, and I'm serious, it's too early to make a definitive judgment. He achieved peace with Jordan. Luckily, his attempts to make peace with Syria by giving up the Golan Heights were not successful. Can you imagine now Israel without the Golan Heights? He tried. Assad, the father, was not ready to go for the deal. The attempt to make peace with the Palestinians failed and produced thousands of Israeli casualties. Some people speak about it as a strategic blunder. I don't know if this is true. I know it produced a not very neat partition. A partition, still. Not all partitions are neat. Take a look at other places in the world. Israelis definitely do not want to go back to Nablus, Jenin, or Gaza. We ended up with a self-governing Palestinian entity in the West Bank and a proto-state in Gaza, something that Rabin probably could have lived with. Unfortunately, these entities are not at peace with Israel, are actually a source of continuous terrorism. Moreover, they try to delegitimize the Jewish state. The consul has said they try to take away the Western world. They try to take away something which is more important, the Temple Mount. They deny our historic links to the holiest place of Judaism. It doesn't look very good for my hero of 1967. But we try to make peace. And leaders sometimes take historic gambles. And Rabin was courageous enough to take a historic gamble despite the fact that he was not sure this is the right partner. Despite the fact that he feared that it's not going to work. His efforts have clearly at least one good result. Israelis, and this is what counts, are convinced, with very few exceptions, that it was not our fault. We tried. We were rejected. This insight has tremendous effect on Israel's, on the readiness of Israel society to go on and fight when necessary. Social cohesion is a most important requirement in protracted, intractable conflict. There is no more accurate description of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It is a protracted, intractable conflict with no solution in sight. Rabin was an honest leader of incredible integrity. He never embellished reality. He would have, had, he would have recognized the unpleasant facts. He had one of the best analytical minds in the country. I'm quite sure. He would have used force, probably what it's called now by our friends, excessive use of force, to curb terrorism. He was no vegetarian. <laughs> he would have appealed, probably as in the past, for patience and would have warned against miraculous shortcuts. 
And I'm adding, beware of false, mes false messiahs. And unfortunately, today, as in the days of Yermiahu, we have false prophets in Boston as well. It is a great pity that Rabin didn't live to say to the world and to the skepticals about Israel's seriousness, about making peace. We really try. Thank you. I wish I could be with you in person for the Itzhak Rabin Memorial Lecture at the Eliezer Center for Jewish Studies at Boston University. But I'm very glad to be part of this event and grateful for the opportunity to recognize one of the greatest and finest men I've ever known, Itzhak Rabin. This year's lecture holds special meaning as we mark the 20th anniversary of his death. And I can think of no better way to honor the risks he took for peace and the sacrifice he made by seeking to understand and to sustain his legacy. For more than 50 years, as a member of the military and one of Israel's founding fathers, Prime Minister Rabin was instrumental in protecting Israel's security. Ultimately, he understood that no matter where we live, our future stability depends not just on the strength of our defenses, but on our relationships with our neighbors. By working to build lasting relationships based on mutual understanding, Prime Minister Rabin created the conditions for peace. He was a man of uncommon courage and unbounded wisdom. I cherished his friendship, and I am absolutely convinced that had he lived, we would have seen the peace he so deeply desired. Now it's up to the rest of us to finish his work. And I'm very grateful that you're devoting time and attention to emphasizing the importance of diplomacy and compromise in securing solutions to some of the worst conflicts we face in the world. I hope each one of you will become part of the process of building a better future. And I wish you all the best in this important endeavor. Believe me, it's Akrabian is smiling down on you and pulling for you. So I'm now inviting our panelists to join us here on the stage um, and uh, just introducing our speakers from uh, right, uh, stage left to stage right, um, starting with uh, David Ellenson, who's just taking his seat here to my left. Uh, David Ellenson is the long-term or was the long-term president of Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati and trained many, many rabbis and uh, other uh, great people who are now leaders of the American Jewish community. He's now at Brandeis University. He thought, he told me earlier, he was retiring, but he's uh, now agreed to lead the uh, Schusterman Center for Israel Studies at uh, Brandeis University, at least for a term of three years. Uh, next to David Ellenson is Andy Basevich, former professor and chair of international relations here at Boston University. He's a good friend, and we are very pleased to have him back on campus. He is now uh, mostly elsewhere. Uh, <laughs> other small institutions like Columbia University and so forth. Uh, Susanna Herschel, to uh, Andy Basevich's left. Um, is a, pr a professor of Jewish studies at uh, Dartmouth College. She's uh, a multi-talented, uh, incredible scholar in so many ways. I first encountered her work as an author of uh, uh, Jewish feminist theology, but she's also in, in a very erudite uh, uh, scholar of German Protestant theology and all kinds of unlikely subjects. Uh, so uh, very pleased to have you here with us. And then last but not least on the podium, Jeff Jacoby, who is known to all of us as a columnist. We read his uh, uh, columns assiduously, even if we don't agree with them. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm very pleased that he's joining us tonight. Um, he has a column to write for tomorrow morning, so we may hear about tonight's event in tomorrow's Boston Globe. And uh, uh, our host 
for this panel discussion who will lead the discussion is Tom Ashbrook. He needs no further introduction. So I'm ha passing it on to <laughs> Tom Ashbrook. Thank you, very much. Uh, thank you very much, Michael Zank, and thank you, Efram Inbar, for your uh, compelling remarks. Um, it's an honor to be here at the Elie Wiesel Center. It's a sober honor on the 20th anniversary coming of an assassination of such a remarkable man. And I just want to recognize that sober quality of this as we walk into our debate tonight. A man was shot and killed, the leader of a very important nation by a member of his own nation. And it's a sad thing to remember. Um, on a lighter note, I see that our panelists are seated like masters of the universe at this table, and I appear to be in a French cafe. <laughs> if, uh, if, an ac if a French accent begins to creep into my questions, you'll know why. I, I'm waiting for the menu. Uh, I wonder if we could start with uh, some thoughts on this moment. Here we are, 20 years after Rabin, and uh, two minutes after Ifram Inbar's remarks, and one after Bill Clinton's. Susanna, I'll start with you. I guess my broad question is if you could just, some, just a few opening remarks to speak to this moment, uh, 20 years on, uh, where things stand, and is it? Ifram Inbar's observation that Itzhak Rabin would say, we tried, or Bill Clinton's, he would have seen the peace he so deeply desired. Thank you. It is, in fact, a very sober moment for all of us. I imagine everyone here remembers the moment when we heard the terrible news that Rabin had been assassinated and the terrible, terrible sadness that came over us that has lasted a very long time. A terrible thing that a Jew would kill a Jew. So we heard tonight from Professor Inbar, who has written, by the way, an excellent book on Yitzhak Rabin that I recommend to everyone. If you haven't read it already, go and read it. Um, I, I, we heard the, a very pessimistic and rather depressing uh, talk. And I think that we, first of all, from the Jewish tradition, and I am a professor of Jewish studies, we have to remember that evil is never the climax of history. However badly things have been, we have to have hope for the future, and we are forbidden as Jews to despair. So I think what we're left with now from Professor Inbar is the question of, it didn't work until now, our peacemaking efforts. What are we going to do for the future? We've looked at the past, but what is our vision 50 years from now, 100 years from now, and how can we get there, and how can we today take responsibility for bringing that to pass 50 years from now, 100 years from now, whatever it takes, to make peace. Peace is made not only by prime ministers. It's made by individual citizens. It's an individual personal responsibility as well. Must have optimism, even in the face of this description. Daniel Ellison, your thoughts on this moment and this characterization of where things stand? <laughs> David, excuse me. Yes. Uh, well, excuse first, me, I want to also say what a privilege it is to be here tonight. And I want to thank Michael especially for this invitation. Uh, this is the second time in a month that I've heard Ephraim speak. Uh, I will confess, I share a great many of your, uh, of your feelings and your sensibilities. Uh, and also worry very, very much about the issues of security that confront the Jewish state. At the same time, I do respond to what uh, my colleague, Professor Heschel, said. Uh, I think the need to continue to work towards the kind of solutions that I still believe Prime Minister Rabin envisioned for peace in this region are ultimately too significant for us to surrender to a certain kind of, perhaps it's realism, but I would also assert to some degree pessimism. As I listened to the words tonight, I recall 
a session I attended a number of years ago uh, at UCLA when I was a visiting professor there, and Edward Said uh, spoke with Shaul Friedlander. Professor Friedlander, of course, was one of the founders of Peace Now in uh, Israel. He taught at Tel Aviv University, arguably the greatest scholar of European anti-Semitism uh, in the entire world. He certainly stood very much on the left within Israel. He and Professor Said, whose views I don't think I need to characterize here, uh, were basically in absolute agreement about virtually everything they said about Israel. But at a certain point, Said was critical of Yasser Arafat because he believed that Yasser Arafat, in signing the Oslo Accords, had subverted the 1964 Palestinian Covenant, which called for the destruction of the Jewish state. And it was at that point Shaul Friedlander who had agreed with virtually everything that Said had said in terms of his analysis and the culpability of the Israelis in not allowing a peace to be achieved, uh, stood up at that moment, and it's in a moment that I've really never forgotten, and it, I believe it relates to when we talk about Rabin's legacy tonight. He said, you know, Edward, he said, up to now, he said, I could hear everything you've said. He said, but what you've just said, you, Edward Said, as the most responsible Palestinian intellectual in the entire world, when you say that Yasser Arafat had no right, as he saw it, to obviate that plank in the platform of the PLO in 1964 that called for the destruction of the Jewish state, said, here, he said, I think you're being irresponsible. He said, my friends often point to me and say to me uh, that the real challenge is, he said, that you, Shaul, are naive in your own views. And he said, when you say something like that, Edward, he said, I think maybe to some degree they're correct. But then he told a story, he told a story that in 19... 56, there had been uh, an Arab who had come in from Gaza and who had uh, killed an Israeli on the Israeli side of the line, and that uh, Moshe Dayan delivered a eulogy at the funeral. And at that point in 56, Dayan had made the point that if I were a Palestinian, or he probably said Arab at that point, he said, I might have done the same thing that this man did, and as a result, there will always be war between our two sides. And it was at that point that Friedlander made the observation that it is really that psychological mindset that we absolutely need to overcome. That as long as we are convinced that peace is not possible because of intransigence and even inhumanity and perhaps even evil on each side, peace really never will come. And the challenge then, and I think this is the ultimate legacy of Prime Minister Rabin, is that the same man who said in 1986 when the Intifada began, in quotes, I'm going to break their bones, was eight years later, seven years later, on the grounds of the White House, shaking, however tentatively, however reluctantly, the hand of Yasser Arafat. And it's that kind of ultimate pragmatism and optimism that I think marks the ultimate trajectory of Prime Minister Rabin's life that remains, at least for me at this moment, the most enduring part of his legacy for us. Thank you, David Ellenson. Andy Basevich, opening thoughts on this moment, the 20th anniversary of the assassination, and the remarks we have heard so far tonight. Well, uh, my friend Ephraim said uh, that he believes that there is, quoting now, no chance whatsoever of a two-state solution. And I'm sorry to say that I think he's right. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily correct to uh, hold Prime Minister Rabin accountable for that failure, nor would I endorse the views of President Clinton that if Rabin had simply lived, we would have a, a happier outcome. That seems to me to assign uh, to the actions of individuals far more importance than they deserve. If we think about the present moment, and this is why I reluctantly uh, agree, the present, the pre the, the moment when the Oslo agreements were signed back in 1993, in retrospect, appeared to be positively benign. Uh, the chaos that Ephraim uh, referred to in the region uh, is very real. I'm sorry to say uh, 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 caused in considerable part 
and by the folly of uh, the United States in engaging in the wars that it initiated in the aftermath of 9-11. Uh, so, so yeah, I think I think that uh, the prospects of peace uh, are dismal. I probably would differ from a, fr a frame in sort of, uh, and, and, and it's probably in some senses futile to sort of try to assign blame. Uh, but if I may, I, th I think that your uh, presentation tended to point to uh, the Palestinians as principally responsible for the absence of peace. I think that I'd probably. Uh, put the balance somewhat differently. Uh, I don't. I don't think that the word settlements was uttered at any point uh, in your in your presentation. I personally uh, would argue that the existence of settlements, the expansion of settlements by, I believe, virtually every government since 1967, has at the very least uh, complicated the problem. And then there are the, and I'm not an expert on Israeli politics, but it seems to me that when we examine the fractured nature of Israeli politics and the difficulty of forming and maintaining coalitions and the way that, that Israeli politics then elicit expressions with regard to the peace process or the prospects of Palestinian statehood, I'm obviously referring here to things that Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, said in the run-up to the last election, certainly that uh, aspect of the situation for which the government is, of Israel is responsible also further undermines any possibility of a two-state solution. So I share Ephraim's pessimism. I don't necessarily quite share the, uh, his analysis. Andy Basevich, Andrew Basevich, thank you very much. And Jeff Jacoby, finally to you before we dive in. Your thoughts on this moment, 20 years after the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin and the remarks we've heard so far this evening. I've been thinking about uh, the Nobel Peace Prize. Here we are at the George Sherman Union, and as I walk into the building, there's a big pylon in the lobby, in, in, the, uh, in, in the pavilion outside that lists the Nobel Peace Prizes and other, other Nobel laureates that uh, Boston University has been associated with. Of course, Elie Wiesel being one of them, Martin Luther King being another. Uh, the Nobel Peace Prize this year was awarded, as you know, to the National Dialogue Quartet in Tunisia, which now has a functioning democracy, somewhat shaky, but managing to hold it together. It was from Tunisia that Yasser Arafat and the PLO were brought to Israel and installed in Ramallah and in Gaza as a result of the Oslo process. Uh, I can't help but think that if the PLO and Arafat were still in Tunisia, that Tunisia would not be a democracy today, and there would be no national dialogue quartet uh, that would be celebrating democracy and winning a Nobel Prize for it. I remember calling Elie Wiesel uh, after it was announced in 1994 that the Nobel Prize was going to be awarded that year to, um, uh, to Yitzhak Rabin, to Shimon Peres, and to Yasser Arafat, and asked him what he thought about it, and he, we were on the phone, but I could almost hear him shaking his head sadly and, and, and ruefully at the thought that Yasser Arafat was going to be a Nobel Peace Laureate. And he said to me, to think that he and I will now be in the same club, at least he should apologize for all the children he killed. There was one dissenter, as you may know, on the, Nobel, on the Oslo Nobel Committee uh, that awarded that prize. Uh, member, as, as all the Oslo, uh, uh, all the Norwegian uh, uh, Nobel Committee members are a member of the Norwegian Parliament uh, named Kari Christensen. He resigned from the Nobel Committee in protest against the award to Arafat. He explained to me that the rule, or at least the tradition, has been that the Nobel Peace Prize only can be awarded uh, when there's unanimous agreement. If all of his colleagues disagreed with him, uh, he felt that he shouldn't stand in their way. Um, so he resigned from the committee, and on the day that the Nobel ceremony was to take place in Oslo, he was in Israel to give a speech uh, about his views. He stopped in Boston on his way to Israel, and I had the privilege of, of, of uh, having breakfast with him when he was here, and then of going to Brandeis University, where he spoke that night at an organization, at, at a, at a, at a uh, assembly 
for the students and for the faculty. And I was asked to introduce him. Uh, the person who invited me to give that introduction was a student named Elisa Flaytow. She was a, a sophomore, I believe, at Brandeis University. Lovely young woman, uh, very active in, in Jewish, in Jewish uh, campus affairs. The event took place the following summer. Elisa traveled to the Middle East on a, uh, uh, an educational program, and she was on a bus that was blown up by Islamic Jihad in Gaza, and she died. It seems to me that there are dots to connect here, and perhaps the, the biggest question about the legacy of Yitzhak Rabin after all these years uh, is to wonder whether it would only have been another few months before he pulled the plug on Oslo, or whether, like so many of his countrymen, he would have uh, felt wrapped in the belief that if we just try harder, just make more concessions, just offer more, just show greater flexibility, uh, peace will come, it will be possible. Uh, it didn't end in 1995 with, uh, with Rabin's assassination. It didn't end in all of the, 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 the terrible terror attacks that took place in the Second Intifada in 2000 and 2001. In 2005, the same uh, mindset was still so strong in Israel when Arik Sharon, of all people, led the move to drive 9,000 Jewish residents out of their homes in Gaza. It took a lot to, for Israelis to get to the point that, uh, that the Ephraim Inbar says they're at now of having the insight and the realization that they really tried, that the failure of the peace process was not their fault, uh, and the recognition, if that is indeed what has, uh, what has finally been rooted, uh, that this struggle, this conflict, this hostility uh, is in for a long period of working out that this young conflict, as Ephraim Inbar says, is, is not remotely within, within the sight of a, of a comprehensive final status uh, piece. I don't know, nobody knows what Rabin would have done, but I would like to think that if he was indeed the realist and the practical man of facts uh, that, that, uh, that Ephraim Inbar says he is, that he would have come to the realization sooner rather than later, uh, and that not nearly as many lives would have been lost in all the years since then. Jeff Jacoby, thank you very much. Um, in about 30 minutes, we're going to dive in now. In about 30 minutes, we will take questions from the audience. There will be microphones floating. And so if you have them, formulate them, and we will come to you. Uh, I would just note, uh, speaking of this as a young conflict, uh, for me, certainly, is a very painful idea. It's, there's been so much pain and death already. And the idea that this is young, uh, in a, as such a close ally of the United States, my country, uh, part of my life and many others, not to mention all of Israelis' lives and all of Palestinians. It's a very painful idea. And I would also note the pain that many would feel at the deaths of many children, to your point, Jeff, Israeli and Palestinian, over these years. This is hard to observe and harder still to be part of, whether you're Israeli or Palestinian. I wonder if I can ask each of you, and Suzanne, I'll start with you. There is a sense in Professor Inbar's remarks, this is a young conflict. We're digging in. The focus is on security. Uh, the notion of waiting until both sides are exhausted, talking about hundreds of years uh, in his parallel with Turks and Greeks, perhaps. I wonder your view, can this current situation in Israel, with Israelis and Palestinians, be sustained? This security-focused, locked-up situation, if yes, with what eventual outcome? If no, with what consequences? It's a terrible situation on every level. And in fact, I believe it was Professor Inbar that, uh, who talked about the security burden of the current situation of the occupation. There is, in fact, as we all know, there is no real security without peace. So that is, um, peace is not something to be dismissed, to say this is impossible, we tried for so long, so it's hopeless. And that's what worries me. I keep hearing about how terrible, how terrible the situation has been. We have no one to talk to. Palestinians don't want peace. There is no state in the Middle East. 
you know, uh, we have to be prepared for the possibility that indeed, maybe not now in our lifetime, but in the next one, there will in fact be Palestinians who warmly want to make peace with Israel and Israelis who warmly want to make peace with Palestinians. If we keep repeating the same canards about Palestinians, this will not make us ready for peace. Now, what are some of the problems, you ask? Tom, you know, Jews don't speak to Jews very often because they are in such conflict and such antagonism. They don't speak to Jews about what? They about Israel and what to do, right wing, left wing. If you're left wing, the right wing says you're anti-Israel, you're an anti-Semite, et cetera, et cetera. We don't have conversations. We don't allow it. There is a tone of hysteria. And what Prime Minister Netanyahu just said, by the way, about uh, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem being the one who gave Hitler the idea for the Holocaust, of the Holocaust, not historically which is accurate. outrageous. It's inaccurate, and it's politically inflammatory. It just does terrible things, by the way, for, yes, for us as Jews with anti-Semitism in Europe. And just to clarify, the decision was made months before the end of November 1941, when that meeting took place between the Mufti and, and Hitler and so the, forth. The go for the Holocaust decision by the Nazis, you're saying? The Nazis had already started killing. Hitler yeah. had already made the decision. That's very clear, whether you go with Breitman's argument of July or with Browning in October. OK, anyway, there well, is a demagoguery. Thing for, the, for the leader of Israel to assert, though, in 2015. What's the point of it, then, politically? Why would he do such a thing? I don't know. Why would, he give, why would he give armament, so to speak, to the neo-Nazis in Europe to say such a thing? To try to demonize Palestinians to that extent? What good does that do to us? It's a terrible thing to demonize Palestinians and to demonize other Jews. On some level, we have to stop this if we're going to have any kind of hope for the future and the possibility of making peace. We can't go around like this. And the fact is, as Professor Inbar himself has written, there is a security burden with the current situation. There is no security without peace. And now Israel is so strong, what a perfect time. The Middle East actually wants this peace. Even the Saudis indicate that they want this. Can't we begin to have some negotiation? David Ellenson, what about the current Israeli strategy? Is it sustainable? With what implications? If not, with what implications? <laughs> Is the Israeli strategy uh, sustainable? Uh, I want to begin. I could say that I'm not the uh, an Ilo Navi, Velo Ben Navi. I'm not a prophet, nor the child of prophets. Uh, and I'm actually not even a political scientist. I mean, that is to say, I am a student of uh, Judaism as a religion. Uh, and my own actual area of expertise is Orthodox Judaism in 19th century Germany. Uh, so I am used to people uh, saying, as it were, negative things about one another in, uh, in, many, different, uh, in many different settings. Uh, you know, in response to your question, though, I mean, what I would say is that it is quite clear that power alone, political power in this kind of situation, or military power, I mean, obviously, uh, Professor Inbar, the definition you gave, the Weberian definition of a state, a state holds not only a monopoly on violence, but the way in which he states it is a monopoly on legitimate violence. In other words, the state has the right legitimately to use power to uh, coerce people into behaving one way or another. Quite clearly, what we have is a situation where people, frankly, on both sides, uh, use power, as it were, force almost indiscriminately. And power alone is not going to resolve the issue. We're going to have to resolve the issue by some kind of political solution as well. But the question comes to be, how do you, in fact, achieve that political solution? I think where Professor Inbar is completely correct is that I suspect there are people, certainly on the Israeli side and on both sides, who are prepared to do that, but no one's done it yet very uh, successfully for a whole variety of reasons. Uh, one of the issues when Professor Heschel, Susanna just made the point she did, I think it is important to keep in mind when we talk about the legacy of Prime Minister Rabin, uh, we should look to some degree to Prime Minister Netanyahu. Part of, I think, the great strength of Prime Minister Rabin is that ultimately he proved above all things, not only, of course, to believe 
in the right of the Jewish people to our historic homeland uh, in Eretz Yisrael, in the land that uh, was the land of our ancestors. But of course, he proved to be really quite pragmatic and really quite prudential. I do think that with Prime Minister Netanyahu, you have someone who is really much more ideologically uh, oriented in many, many significant ways than was true, frankly, even with Prime Minister, Netan uh, Prime Minister Rabin. I think one of the great differences over the last few years in Israeli policy has been a move from the kind of Israeli pragmatism of which people like Abba Evan used to boast to a much more um, ideological kind of, kind of commitment. I think it's important here to keep in mind Prime Minister Netanyahu, if I can speak about him for a moment, his entire background. I mean, one only has to look at the writings of his father, Ben Sion Netanyahu, really one of the greatest scholars of the Spanish Inquisition in the history of uh, modern Jewish scholarship. I looked to my friend, Professor Stephen Katz here. I think he could attest to that. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's father uh, wrote a book uh, that really does embody, perhaps correctly, a lachrymose view of Jewish history. Namely, it is a history of the Inquisition, and he grew up in a household that really did emphasize the notion that the Jewish people have real enemies who are out to destroy us. By the way, that does not represent, in my opinion, paranoia, and even if it is a bit paranoid, there are people who are still out in quotes, to get us, or have been out to get us. He's not incorrect about that. But keep in mind that part of the reason why Prime Minister Netanyahu even grew up in the United States is that his father would not accept the accord that Ben-Gurion accepted in 1947. Did David Ben-Gurion want a larger Medina Israel when the UN voted to establish the state on Kuftet November, on the 29th of November, 1947? Yes. Was he willing to accept half a loaf because this way he could get a state? That would be a good model, by the way, for Palestinian leadership to have grasped at different times as well. For Prime Minister Netanyahu, though, he grew up in a home that was strongly ideological. It is interesting to me that if we look at Prime Minister Olmert, Prime Minister Sharon, whether their positions were in fact mistaken when they attempted to negotiate a peace or when Prime Minister Netanyahu unilaterally withdrew from Gaza, that's a matter I leave to political scientists uh, to discuss. What did I say, Sharon? Yeah, Sharon is who I meant. But the reality is these men showed a great deal of pragmatism. Do I think, and now Professor Inbar, I respond directly to you and I look forward to your response. Do the Jews have a right to be on the Temple Mount? Yes. Do we have a right to be in Yehuda Shomron? Yes. But the reality is, does it represent a pragmatic prudential stance on the part of the Jewish state at this point to provocatively affirm these rights at this moment. That's the part that I question. It isn't that I, as a person who has internalized a kind of Jewish narrative and feel that I have an historical right to my ancestral homeland in the state of Israel, through the state of Israel, to the land of Israel, uh, there I think that Prime Minister Netanyahu could show a greater degree of pragmatism. But when you ask the question, why does he make the statement that Hitler designed the final solution, the death of our people in concentration camps as a result of what is clearly an anti-Semitic position that the Grand Mufti held, I think it is because it fits into a larger lachrymose narrative, which he has in fact internalized and may, may, I'm not positive, even believe. The last point I'd make, is this a young conflict? It is, on one level. But here I would make a point. I once heard Professor Michael Walzer give a lecture where Walzer pointed out that when ethnic conflict is tied into religiosity, it lasts for centuries, not decades, centuries. And I think one of the saddest things that has happened to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, even in the last 15 to 20 years, though if I had time, I'd go back to the messianism that 1967 unleashed in Israel, is that what had been principally Principally, I think a secular conflict between two peoples has, over the last decade, even since Oslo, the last 20 years, become more and more involved in religion. And that is one of the reasons why it comes to be that much more difficult to unravel this kind of problem. So I suppose in the end, what we have is, is a tremendous kind of challenge before us 
But the fact is, it may be a young conflict by certain standards, but I think in the end what we need is an ethic of aspiration that can allow us to overcome it because the reality is that even if one knows historically that conflicts like this can last quite literally for centuries, for these children and these adults who are being killed in Palestine and Israel today, I think it provides, and I'll speak for myself, very little nechemta. It does not provide a great deal of consolation to know historically that problems can last for decades, and therefore the urgency to respond is just that much greater. David Ellenson, thank you. I should say Professor Inbar will rejoin the conversation in a few minutes. Andy Bacevich, at one time, on the same point, at one time we were told there is no alternative to peace. Now the message seems to be, yes, there is. We can dig in on a security-first strategy indefinitely. This is your area, strategy. Is, is that workable in this arena? I, I don't know if you've noticed, but I'm actually the token panelist. <laughs> I'm the only person up here who comes from Indiana. I'm from Virginia. Does Ohio count? No. They and, used to be the Shabbos guy. You're and, the weekday guy. And as an American from Indiana who's, who's, who's not Jewish, uh, I quite seriously am reluctant to pronounce on what Israelis or the Israeli government ought to do, or frankly, what Palestinians should think or what they should do. So my response to the strategic question is going to come at it from an American perspective. Ephraim's uh, presentation and also his, his book, which I quickly paged through again uh, today because he gave me a copy years ago, emphasizes that Rabin was first, foremost, always an Israeli patriot whose commitment to the security and well-being of the state of Israel and his people was resolute and unwavering. And I would argue that Rabin's counterparts in this country, that is to say our American political leaders, share that same solemn obligation to act in ways that advance the interests, the security, and the well-being of the American people. Why do I make that rather obvious point? Because I'd argue that the interests of the United States of America and the interests of the State of Israel are diverging in very important and profound ways. I would acknowledge that sort of at the retail level of politics, you know, what, what candidates for the presidency say, evidence of that divergence is very difficult to identify because they all say, you know, together forever, no daylight between us, our best friends, and so on and so on and so on. But I think beneath the surface there's a different reality uh, that is actually coming into existence, and it's a reality that it, it, it behooves us uh, to acknowledge. What's the evidence? Well, I think the evidence, uh, one, one piece of evidence is the, uh, what I would interpret to be, uh, the growing uh, energy of the BDS movement uh, in many parts of American society and most significantly on American college campuses. If, if college campuses tend to be incubators of political change in our society, and I think to a considerable de degree they are, then it, it, that, that it's important to pay attention to the BDS movement. More, perhaps more significantly, certainly more immediate, is the Obama administration's uh, going through with the Iran nuclear deal over the strongly expressed uh, protest of the Netanyahu uh, government. But even looking beyond these sort of bits of evidence, it seems to me that the, the real issue, the real divergence, the, the thing that's going to potentially, I'm not, not predicting, but could, could see uh, dividing the United States from Israel, it seems to me, is the settlement movement that I referred to a few uh, minutes ago. 
Were I an Israeli Jew, I think I probably would be a supporter of settlements. Uh, I'm not an Israeli Jew. I'm an American Catholic. Uh, and it seems pretty evident to me that the continuation and expansion of the settlements on the West Bank uh, is, to put it mildly, uh, contrary to the interests of the United States of America. Or to put it another way, that the United States of America increasingly has a very pressing interest, urgent need, to have that issue addressed and redressed. Why? To test the proposition, and it's only a proposition, to test the proposition that the grievances of the Palestinians, or if you prefer, the putative grievances of the Palestinian, somehow define the root cause of anti-Western and anti-American sentiment throughout much of the Islamic world to test the proposition that that's the root cause. Why is it important, increasingly important, to do that? Well, because the young conflict, and again, I agree with Professor Inbar, in many respects, this is likely to be a young conflict. It's only been going on since the uh, creation of the State of Israel barely more than a half century ago. That conflict is becoming an old conflict to the American people. We've only been at it, you know, pick your date. I, th I think 1980 is a good date. Probably most people would pick 9-11 as a good date. We've been at it for a far shorter period of time, and guess what? It ain't going well. And it's costing us a lot of money. And it's costing us more lives than most Americans are willing to forfeit. So we're not willing, I'm saying we like I speak for everybody, we're not willing to engage in a conflict that is going to last for centuries. We need to find a way. In, in, in advancing the security interests of the United States to bring that conflict to an end. So I think, I think that uh, and testing this proposition about the Palestinians is one way to do that. And, 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 and I'd finally, I'd simply say that, uh, that, that uh, both Israelis and Americans who support the state of Israel really ought to contemplate the implications of allowing this divergence to continue. Uh, Susanna Hesch, I see you eager, but Jeff, and let's break format a little bit. I'd love you to respond to Andy's observation here about the United States and Israel's interests. Can Israel go it alone over time without this strong alliance? Do you see these interests diverging? Uh, for, well, let's see. When we are told that all the presidential candidates and all political candidates, uh, right, left, and center, always voice the same platitudes and talk about this is the most uh, special of relationships and no daylight uh, between the two countries, I would only point out that not all candidates uh, are opposed to daylight, that some candidates actually run for office and proclaim that they will expand the amount of daylight between the United States and Israel. And uh, over the past six and a half years, we've seen uh, what that can do to U.S.-Israeli relations. If there is indeed a divergence, I don't know that it's because Indiana Catholics and Heartland Americans are getting sick of supporting Israel. If anything, uh, support for Israel at the American grassroots level still seems to be very profound. It's becoming somewhat polarized politically with more of that support concentrated on the right among Republicans and less of it concentrated on the left among Democrats. Uh, but, you know, for all the, the Sturm und Drang about uh, uh, Bibi Netanyahu's third, count them, third uh, speech to a joint session of Congress, uh, even though a number of Democrats didn't show up, the vast majority of Congress was there. Democrats and Republicans, uh, Indianans and, 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 uh, and Californians and, and New Yorkers all. So, so whether net, there's a, net, whether you there's, think Israel has a permanent lock on American strategic per, support? Nothing, nothing is permanent in this world. But that, the idea that there's a divergence because this conflict can be tiresome to read about or to see on the news, I'm not sure that I agree with. What I would say is that similar arguments have been made at virtually every stage of the Arab-Israeli conflict about the role and the importance and the... Uh, the, the, the interest of the United States. Uh, the Truman administration warned David Ben-Gurion that it would not be in his interest, and it certainly was opposed by the United States, to declare West Jerusalem the capital of Israel. Uh, uh, Levi Eshkol was firmly told by LBJ in 1967 that as long as Israel didn't go it alone, it would not stand alone. Israel 
uh, did go it alone, as it were, and it, it launched that preemptive attack in 1967. Imagine where Israel and where the Jews of the world would be if Israel hadn't done that. We've, we've seen these tensions frequently between the White House and the Prime Minister's office. I don't mean just this White House or just the current Israeli Prime Minister. Uh, that, that seems to be part of the, part of the relationship. Uh, but the idea that somehow this is at a crisis point uh, that I don't buy. Uh, we keep talking about a young conflict, an old conflict. Uh, there was a time, you know, you don't have to be that old to remember when the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union uh, was seen as something that would presumably go on forever. Nobody saw an end date to it. Uh, Ronald Reagan famously told his people when he became president that he had a strategy and, you know, or, or an idea. My idea is we win and they lose. That, that, that is seen and was seen as uh, as simplistic and foolish, uh, nobody thought that the, that, the, that, the, that the Berlin Wall was going to come down or that the Soviet Union was going to implode when it did. We don't know. We can look back, we can draw conclusions and make speculation about what Rabin might have done. We can try to look forward and imagine where this conflict may go and what the role of the United States under a different president or Israel under a different prime minister might be. Uh, the best we can say is you do the best you can. And at the moment, I think for, for Israelis and for the friends of Israel, uh, the best that can be done is to remember Israel wasn't created for the sake of peace. Israel was created so that there would be a Jewish homeland. That homeland has thrived, that, that Jewish state has thrived now uh, for, for, uh, for, uh, for, for 67 years. years. Uh, Israel has become an, e an economic power, a military power, all without... Uh, all, all without peace ever having been conclusively and firmly established. Uh, we don't need to be quite so pessimistic about what happens if today's advice isn't taken immediately by those who, uh, who have to make the decision. Andy, I want to come back to you for rejoinder, but Susan Heschel, please, I see, Suzanne, I see you going to jump in there. I'm responding by a couple of a very concrete points, and that is, first of all, let me just say that I, Zionism is a great dream, a great vision, an extraordinary accomplishment. Uh, let's just be realistic. Israel has contributed great things to this world, and I would imagine that every single person and the globe has something from Israel, whether it's Waze in your iPod or if it's a, yep. a pill, a generic pill from Teva. Okay, what is the problem? I don't think most people can, are concerned about the existence of Israel per se, except, again, a few screaming voices. What they are concerned about is basically is human rights, and that is a big issue for us. So a few years ago, I heard Professor Ruth Wise give a seminar at Harvard saying that the greatest threat to the Jewish people today is human rights, because it's something that is directed against the state of Israel. That's the problem. Is it necessary? How is it, how is it possible that when Borch Goldstein went into a mosque in Hebron with a machine gun, that the response to that from a labor government would be to open the door of Hebron to Jewish settlers? Why would that happen? And that his grave would become a shrine? This is the kind of problem that people object to in Israel. Of course, there are going to be terrible civilian casualties any time an Air Force drops bombs. We know that. But you know when one family, a Palestinian family, is told to get out of their apartment and a Jewish family is moved in, think of what that creates. This is not peacemaking. And that's where our differences really lie. To what extent can we engage in the, and support this kind of thing? That's the problem. Not Israel itself, but the kinds of activities, policies, and even wars that are fought on behalf of an occupation. That's the problem. A Andrew Bates, which I'll come back to you, but David Ellenson, if I may, and then I want to invite Professor Inbar back. Could we just, on that point, could we go to ideology? I mean, when Yitzhak Rabin was assassinated, it was by uh, what Professor Inbar called a right-wing fanatic. Today, you know, his movement is a significant, the assassin's movement is a significant political player in Israel. Uh, you have a, uh, an increasingly sort of hard-nosed religious Zionism, not much interest in compromise, very much tied into the settlement movement. What's the source of this ideology? Is it consistent with the possibility of peace, or is this the fuel for the long war? You're asking me to respond, yes. or you want to answer? No, you to please. First? Well, I mean, quite clearly, when uh, Israel won in the '67 war, it was seen. Uh, it certainly unleashed, as I indicated before, a certain element of uh, religious messianism. Certainly, Rabbi Tzvi Yehuda Cook 
the son of the uh, great first chief Ashkenazic rabbi of the state of Israel, Rav Cook, uh, employed certainly elements of his father's theology that talked about ultimately the holiness of the land and the process of ge'ulah, the process of redemption in the world. Just as we've been talking here about Prime Minister Rabin tonight, whether the senior Rav Cook, Abraham Yitzchak Cohen Cook, would have taken the same positions that his son took, that I can't say, but there were certainly elements of religious messianism that informed uh, the son, and he started the whole Eretz Yisrael HaShlema Gush Emunim uh, movement for the block of the uh, faithful. Uh, Yigal Amir, and some of you may have just read, it's a book that just came out, and I just read it this weekend, uh, entitled Killing a King mm -hmm. by Dan Efron, the Israeli journalist, which is really about the Rabin assassination, and it looks at Yigal Amir as well. Quite clearly, it unleashed uh, certain messianic religious elements. I do want to emphasize that I think probably all Israelis, or many of them, all, all is always a difficult term, but there probably is a consensus that uh, the people Israel have a right, I go back to what I said before, to land on both sides of the Jordan. Whether in fact that right should be exercised is a different issue. Right. By what authority? Right, the Bible? A right, History? A right, a right, uh, we have an historical right as a people to our people's ancestral homeland in the land of Israel. And the Palestinians in that formulation? They have a right too, and that's why there's an issue. I'm, I'm trying to make the point here mm -hmm. that you have, as it were, kind of two narratives that conflict with each other, but part of what 67 unleashed, and it has evolved over the decades, there's no question about it, is that this notion of an historical right to the total homeland of the Jewish people was also seen then as fulfilling uh, a messianic promise. There is, and I find this to be kind of an obscenity, but it is in sort of the literature I read. In the Hebrew, I mean, there was some literature that came out in certain ultra-messianic circles, but Yigal Amir was part of these circles. And he was, by the way, I mean, a superb student in many, many ways. Uh, so we've heard, and he killed Yitzhak Rabin. Uh, now, the, the name... Uh, Yitzchak Rabin, uh, Yigal Amir, begins with the letter Y or the letter Yud, and then Amir ends with the letter R or the letter Resh. And one of the points that's made in some of the literature that I've read is if you take the Yud out of Yigal and you take the Resh out of Amir, you get Yitzchak Rabin. And what are you left with? I don't know if this is too complicated in the Hebrew, because if you don't speak, you're left with Ga'al Ami, redeem my people. So this was seen in some ditties put out by these kinds of circles as a license to religiously justify, as it were. In other words, by the removal of Yitzhak Rabin, he engaged in the, in the murder, as it were, the assassination of someone who uh, was preventing the redemption of the Jewish people. Susanna raised return. human rights. Where do human rights stand in the context of that messianism that you're describing? Who uh, uh, David, please. Oh. Well, where do human rights stand in this? Human rights are not the, uh, are not the major concern in this, in this kind of setting. But I, but I think what's problematic... Yeah, human rights are not the major concern in this kind of setting. From, from this kind of particular perspective, rather it would be a fulfillment of a certain kind of religious messianic kind of vision. That does not mean, and if you meet settlers, that they're not concerned with the rights of... Uh, how should I put it? Palestinians live on the West Bank, but they do see that their God-given right, much as we had manifest destiny in the United States, trumps perhaps what other concerns might be. Or at Is least this a think, moral problem for non-Jewish allies of Israel? I think it's a problem for many Jews, as Susanna said. I don't think it's just a problem for Jew or non-Jew. But here's where the problem comes in. And now I'll just turn from it a little bit. And I want to go back to what Andrew just said a moment ago. The problem with the settlements, in my opinion, I don't know who I'm speaking for except me, is that they obfuscate what I fear is the real issue. And here, I think I agree exactly with Professor Inbar. I knew if I talked long enough, I could get to that point. I don't think the problem is really 1967 or the settlements. Where I do agree with Andrew is it obfuscates the entire problem, and it does create a tremendous moral problem for the Jewish people. I agree with Susanna, but what I genuinely fear is that what has really happened is that there is now a narrative 
that takes place in many circles that simply sees the state of Israel as a colonialist creation. And the problem really is not 1967. I wish we wouldn't engage in the settlements on the West Bank. It would stop that problem from being used as what I fear is a uh, excuse for the condemnation of the state of Israel. What I really fear is the problem isn't 1967. The problem is really 1948. The Israelis are seen. The Israelis, in my opinion, in this narrative, are seen as a colonizing people. And I wished, I believe, that the world absolutely affirm the right of the state of Israel to exist. I do not fear that it seems the state widely of affirmed. To exist. I, I must say, it seems. Uh, well, I'm very, very glad, but I do to think. feel like Senator Webb. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 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 Uh, uh, all the phone. Our time goes. Through. Professor Inbar, would you rejoin us uh, uh, if you don't that mind? That's the fear and, that I have. And, and, and while you do, Susanna, I can see you must do, and then and then Andrew, and then. Uh, Professor Inbar, yes, Jeff. David, you've repeated, of course, the, the ultimate lacrimose that you've just criticized. The whole world wants Israel destroyed. So there's no reason to make any peace or any that, compromise I, I don't think because I they want that. us to go anyway. I don't think I said that. I think that's what's implied if you say it's not about 67, it's about 48, that the whole existence of Israel is not I being do rejected. Fear, I do fear, not, not in terms of the world, but in terms of many, people on the Palestinian side, that is what I fear. I'm sure there are people who don't want us, but you have to understand and admit that you've now returned to the kind of lacrimose history that you criticized Netanyahu's father for giving us, that goes back to Heinrich Gretz, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it, can't there, we there get rid of that? of that? We are so pretend. strong. Israel is a military power, an extraordinary power. It's time to give that up. Andrew Basevich, come in from the Senator Webb corner, please. And then Professor Invar, I'll come to you. I'm withdrawing from the Democratic race, but I may, I may run as an independent. One minute to respond. Stay in the party. Stay one, in the party. One, 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 one minute to respond to uh, Jeff's uh, Cold War analogy and why I think it doesn't work. He correctly uh, quoted President Reagan. My idea of the Cold War is we win, they lose. And then, as you recall, President Reagan immediately invaded Poland. No, wait, he didn't. Wait. Mm -hmm. He didn't. Because the Cold War for which we had been mobilized was not a war that was supposed to involve the shedding of substantial amounts of American blood. When it did involve substantial, uh, shedding su substantial amounts of American blood, i.e. Vietnam, the entire proposition came close to unraveling. And Reagan knew that. So a lot of rhetoric and then a lot of very pragmatic and cautious behavior. And that's where the, the, the comparison breaks down. The guy who thought he was going to be Ronald Reagan, George W. Bush, after 9-11, embarked upon his war. He had his freedom agenda, and he did do the equivalent of invading Poland, except Poland was caused, called Iraq. And that escapade turned out to be a travesty and a failure. And that's why, Jeff, I would argue that even if the American people demonstrated a certain stick to itiveness in the Cold War, especially when they weren't asked to sacrifice in any substantial ways, that's not likely to perceive in our current circumstance where we have been asked to sacrifice. It has been an unavailing and futile episode, and the American people are getting sick of it. And it is that, it seems to me, and again, I'm not predicting, I'm not saying that the United States and Israel are going to split apart. I'm trying to suggest that there are pressures to, to, to cause this divergence. And if you care about the relationship between the United States and Israel, you would do well not to simply ignore and dismiss these things out of hand. Jeff Jacoby, I'll come to you. Professor Inbar, uh, thank you, Andrew Basevich. Would you respond first to Andrew Basevich, as there's much more to look at here, and then we'll take questions, but to his uh, assessment that the strategic interests of the United States and Israel are diverging. Do you agree? And if it's true, can, could Israel go it alone? Uh, those are two separate questions. We'll go alone when we have to go alone. Uh, and, uh, sometimes we'll get the blessing of the United States post facto. Uh, we had lunch uh, two weeks ago, maybe, and, the, and uh, we discussed this issue. So uh, I think uh, the opposite. I think that if we take a look at the Middle East, and the attempt by the United States to retreat from the Middle East, which I perfectly understand. Uh, we also don't want to be there. So, uh, 
uh, I can, uh, I think that Israel eventually, within the present context, strategic context, Israel becomes even more important. You know, there is no real state that can uh, help the United States in any way if it needs. Uh, there is no uh, state in the Middle East that for sure an American land, a plane can land there or uh, a port will be available for the sixth fleet that is no longer there. For, or for the seventh fleet is also no longer there. Uh, so, uh, uh, what? Turkey, Turkey hardly gave you interleague and uh, you know, it, it bombs uh, the Kurds. Uh, Saudis, uh, can you rely on the Saudis? Uh, tomorrow there will be uh, some kind of uh, problem and we see already the first fissures in the Saudi royal family which should be of concern. Egypt has never allowed uh, an American military presence there. So Israel is uh, indeed, you know, uh, your only uh, two ally uh, in, the, in, in the Middle East. Uh, I, I must uh, respond to, to, you know, I was intrigued by the use of uh, terms such as optimism and pessimism. You know, I, I'm policy oriented. You know, I, uh, I think that we should have tried to get a, a true assessment of reality. Uh, optimism, pessimism, those you know, type of feelings are totally irrelevant to, 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 the, uh, to what policy should be. You can be optimistic uh, and still realize that in the near future uh, we, we are in trouble. Uh, Actually, I am optimistic, and I think I have reason to be optimistic, because if I take a look at, uh, at the history of the Arab-Israeli conflict, not only the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, I see a gradual you know, historic improvement. We have peace treaty with Egypt, we have a peace treaty with Jordan. Uh, Saudi Arabia is a tacit ally of ours and hopes uh, that it will save us, that it will save them uh, from the follies of the Obama administration and uh, a nuclear Iran. Uh, so uh, uh, I, I think that uh, there is improvement over time. And uh, for example, at, Amer at Arab universities, now you can study Hebrew, which you couldn't in the past. Uh, you are, uh, they study the enemy, but still they study Hebrew. They say the word Israel. I remember when uh, they didn't issue the word Israel. So obviously there is an improvement in the position of the Israel uh, in the Middle East. By the way, and this is an important observation, this type of dialogue or, is not existent in any Palestinian university. In no Palestinian university, you'll hear sorrow for Israeli and Palestinian casualties. There is a big difference. And I think this moral equivalence that some people try to apply is totally wrong. And I would say it's even immoral. Jeff Jacoby, your thoughts on this last round? So, so two thoughts. One to what, what the Freiman Bar just said. Uh, you, you mentioned it briefly in your speech. It seems to me that this question of freedom, intellectual liberty, uh, uh, the, the, the challenge of debate, which is taken for granted uh, on, by Israelis and which is forbidden on the, uh, among the Palestinians, I think this really is one of the, the terrible legacies of Oslo and of Yitzhak Rabin. I have to point out, Susanna Heschel began this evening by saying that know, even I, among Jews, that is not and my currently eyebrow, the case. That freedom is not as free as And you my suggest. eyebrow shot up when she said that because I don't know about her, but I find myself talking with Jews and hearing from Jews about these subjects all the time. So I, maybe it's different in Hanover, New Hampshire, but boy, in the circles I move in, you can't escape it. But I, I live wonder, in Newton. But, but you said Dartmouth, I was thinking. Yeah, can we but, take a... Um, but, 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 there's, a, there's another point that, that strikes me about this, both in the comments that Suzanne Heschel has made that, that, uh, that Andy Basevich makes. There seems to be this, this planted axiom that, if, that we still need to test the proposition that the Palestinians are genuinely interested in peace and that if we can only remove this particular irritant or make this particular concession, that that will be the acid test and then we'll know for sure. And it seems to me that I've been hearing this argument or some form of it 
forever. What about just removing the settlements to What about it? bringing Yasser Arafat and the PLO back from Tunisia? What about allowing the palace, the, the, you know, I brought with me, I brought with me uh, uh, an op-ed piece that ran in the New York Times. It was written by Benjamin Netanyahu in 1988. The headline on it is, Oust the PLO's Mission from the UN. This is 1988. Five years before Oslo, uh, Netanyahu was then, I think, the, uh, the, the, the Israeli representative to the UN, and he's writing a piece calling on the, on the United States to, and on the UN to kick the PLO observer mission out. Think how far Israel has traveled since then. Uh, you talked earlier, David, uh, about um, uh, the, the ideological nature of Netanyahu. The things that Rabin stood for Professor Inbar mentioned many of them. In his last speech in the Knesset, the last speech he gave before he was assassinated, he emphasized no Palestinian state, no, no dis, uh, uh, dismantling of settlements, certainly not before a, a final peace was reached, uh, no shared control of Jerusalem, no giving up of, uh, of the Jordan Valley. All of these things were Rabin's pragmatic, middle of the road, mainstream Israeli position. Netanyahu has backed away from almost all of them, and whether you believe him or not, since 2009, has said repeatedly that he supports a two-state solution. At I, my for center. The record, he said it at my center. I, I don't support the two-state solution, and I've been, I've been saying it for years, but the idea that there is still some legitimate question about what it is that Israel can do that would once and for all test the proposition that the Palestinian leadership is genuinely interested in peace, and that if only Israel can find that magic, that magic litmus test, all of our questions would be answered. I, I think by this point, it's delusional. We've gone through that test over and over and over again with the results that we see in the headlines today. Our time grows short. Shall we get a couple of questions from the floor? There are microphones. If you raise your hand, uh, yes, sir. Is there a microphone that can come to this gentleman, please? It's been uh, very valuable hearing the young, Please stimulating, however, dark analyses uh, that have been prominent this evening. But I'd like to ask the panel, any people who wish to speak, as to whether outside of Israel and Palestine, outside of the Middle East, in the relationships among major powers, including the US, China, Brazil, uh, Russia, is there some path or some dynamic that can be imagined that could beneficially influence the conditions in the Middle East? Could you elaborate just slightly like, like what? Well, well, for example, a uh, notion of some sort of unusual trade relations uh, with uh, the uh, Chinese Israel. or yeah, well, Chinese, yes, or, or vector that could come and in. Some, some is there, or in other words, I'm, I'm questioning whether or not the focus, which has been valuable, is a bit too confined. Um, would somebody like to jump in on that? Is there some fourth, fifth, or sixth way, or different vector, or just, I don't know, circumstance changing, dynamic? We sell a billion emerge? of dollar a year at least to the Arabs. Arab countries. Every F-15 is a Saudi Arabian uh, Air Force has a wing which is made by Israeli aircraft industries. There are two separate dynamics, economics. I know liberals think that economics are... Well, let, let me raise some. What if China should become the major oil consumer of the Middle East? What if ISIS should extend its caliphate from Lebanon to Pakistan? What if uh, the United States should withdraw in some substantial degree? What if the Soviet Union moves powerfully back into the region? Would any of these change? Soviet Union's gone. So, excuse me, uh, Russia. <laughs> a, a key point. Yeah, a key point. But maybe one day again. Um, uh, uh, Andy, can I throw those at you? Well, I've already withdrawn from running for the presidency, and I'm going to withdraw from my candidacy to be the next national security advisor. Okay. No, I have no, I mean, I have no great ideas. I, I mean, uh, even though Ephraim tells us not to use the words like optimism and pessimism, I, in fact, share his uh, pessimism. I think that the complexity 
of the conflict, the, the roots uh, of the conflict, the, uh, the, the chaotic nature of the region as a whole create uh, monumental uh, uh, barriers uh, and, and let me throw in Israeli domestic politics uh, that I, I think there are no good ideas. As a Catholic, as a Catholic, I would say perhaps Pope Francis can pull a rabbit out of a hat, but, but, but even he may not be able to. Another question? Madam, is there a microphone? Right here, please. Uh, two days ago or yesterday, Daniel Gordas, right, the former president of Hebrew College, had a piece in David, David sorry, David Gordas in the New York Daily News where he based Daniel Gordas. Daniel Gordas. Daniel Gordas. Okay. Daniel. Oh, all right. So uh, anyway, anyway, his point was that the Palestinians essentially, and he uses the story of a woman in his school who is a Palestinian teacher and when no one asked her sort of what she thinks of the conflict and she basically says that you know you're just there for now and you know the the British were there and the Israelis kicked the British out and now you're there and eventually we'll get our land back and that this is sort of the overarching view of the Palestinians what's your view of that? Who would like to respond? Suzanne? Well I read that article uh, and yes, this woman said, uh, you're just here temporarily and then the land will come back to us because it's ours. Some sense to me though, it, I think there are a lot of Israelis and a lot of Jews who think this land is ours and you Palestinians are gonna be leaving pretty soon. So one is a mirror of the other. The article went on to say that her views could only be expressed here, that only in Israel are there great universities, great medical centers, et cetera, she should be happy to be here. And my problem with that is, as a Jew, there are also great universities and great medical centers in the United States, or in Europe, or in Australia, but I still would rather be in a Jewish state of Israel. And I can understand that she might wanna have her state, too where she's in the majority and she's ruling things and she's not a second class citizen. So these positions, I, I disagreed with this conclusion because I thought these were actually mirrors and that's the problem. Another question, uh, sir. Uh, it was a fascinating uh, conversation with four friends and Professor Imbaugh. Uh, but there was, I think, uh, I have no answers about anything you've said tonight. Uh, as Professor Besovich said, it's uh, beyond my ken. But there was, Professor Besovich made the argument that I think is the most troubling, which is about the division between America and Israel because of America's uh, support, necessary support for Israel. But I would say that your analysis, Andy, with all due respect, is a common one, but it's mistaken. And the reason it's mistaken is the Palestinian-Israel conflict is not the root of the chaos in the Arab world. If you go to Tehran like I have done, you read the newspapers in Tehran, all they do is talk about Saudi Arabia. If you go to Saudi Arabia, all they do is talk about Tehran. If you look at the failed state of Pakistan, it has nothing to do with Israel. If you look at the Muslim Brotherhood, it started in the 1920s, has nothing to do with Israel. If you look at the conflict in Syria against Assad has nothing to do with Israel. If you look at the conflict in Iraq and Saddam Hussein's uh, rule has nothing to do with Israel. So I think that Obama came into office with a worldview, which was from the first, he went to Cairo and gave a speech about making things better, that he had a worldview that led to certain conclusions. You can agree with them or disagree with them, but I think that the very, very fundamental notion that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is at the center of the universal struggle with the Arab world, uh, among the Arabs, the chaos in the Middle East, is a mistaken assumption, which is going to be very costly if we don't correct it. And I think in circles in Washington, that's a widespread assumption, and I think that uh, it will lead us to an altogether mistaken policy, not only regarding Israel, but regarding the whole place of the United States in international politics. This is a very interesting point. Uh, Andy Basevich, this is not the germ of the Arab world conflict. Well, I was actually not trying to argue that the Palestinian problem is in fact the root. I was trying to make the point that 
because as you just said, there is a wide, uh, fairly widespread perception that that is the case. That as Americans become increasingly tired of participating in this young conflict that's gonna go on for centuries, and therefore as they begin, as they attempt to examine ways to extract us from the conflict, and extracting us from the conflict means trying to find ways to diminish the level of antipathy in, in the Islamic world directed at the United States, it seems to me quite likely that there will be in increasing political pressure from within the United States that uh, looking toward or insisting upon a more vigorous effort to address the Palestinian issue. And I would fully expect, especially if the current political uh, climate in Israel persists, that that would be heartily rejected. And that therefore, that's where you get pressures for divergence. But if it's not truly the germ of wider Arab uh, dissatisfaction, if that's true, won't that truth over time diminish the significance? You know, the historical explanation that you just get, you, let, let us cite the many factors that contribute to the animosity and unrest. Take that seriously, and I would be glad, I mean, I, I would concede the argument. And quite frankly, that also becomes an argument for the United States to find ways to distance itself from the entire mess. Be, be, because our foolish effort, particularly post 9-11, uh, undertaken on the assumption that we possessed something like military supremacy has yielded outcomes that are quite different from what President Bush and his people promised and frankly different from what most Americans uh, 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 expected. Now, from Ephraim's point of view, from an Israeli perspective, there really is no choice except to continue the struggle. And if the struggle is going to take five centuries to resolve itself, well, let it be five centuries. But we are not in the Middle East. We are not Israel. We are a different country with different interests and different options. And it seems to me that the wisdom suggests to at least consider the possibility that the assumed uh, 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 identity of interest simply is not going to persist as time goes along. Our time grows short. Jeff Jacoby. Tom, I think you, you actually uh, uh, pose, a, uh, in some ways, a, a central question, and I'd like to offer a different answer to it. Uh, you say, if it's indeed true that it's a fallacy that the Arab-Israeli conflict or the Israel-Palestinian conflict is not the cause of all the wider unrest, won't that truth over time uh, remove the, the importance of the conflict? I would say, not as long as Israel is Jewish. Not as long as Israel is the world's only Jewish state. And well, what are you I, suggesting with I, I'm, that? I, I'm suggesting that when it comes to America's interest, in the, America's interest worldwide, there is a particular passion when it comes to Israel and anything involving Israel precisely because of this, this ancient bond between American Christianity and Jewish history. It goes back, back literally to, to the Mayflower. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm making no, no, no uh, uh, malicious point. This isn't meant to suggest that there's some kind of hostility, but rather a conflict, think, a conflict that goes back to, to 1948 that involves a, 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 a bloody border that has uh, re religious populations on two sides, uh, 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 refugees in, in vast numbers, years that follow of terrorism, occasional wars. That's the India-Pakistan conflict and yet it doesn't consume a tiny fraction of the amount uh, of attention that, that the, the Israel-Arab or the Israel-Palestinian conflict gets. Why? Because Israel is Jewish, and for America and Americans, by and large, in a very benign and, and, and uh, uh, admiring way, there's this deep, profound interest in what happens in the Jewish state. For many American Christians, the fact that Israel is the, the place where Jesus uh, lived, was born and died and preached is of, of, of su surpassing importance. It, and I think that that at least is, goes part of the way toward answering why no matter what happens, no matter how, how significant or insignificant this particular conflict is in the wider Middle East, 
What happens to Israel and in Israel will remain of great interest to the United States, sometimes to the, to the frustration of those of us who would occasionally like to remind our colleagues that there are other countries, there are other conflicts, many of them much bloodier, much more violent, much more uh, uh, deadly. Nevertheless, for, for good and for bad, the, the fact that Israel is Jewish is always going to loom very large in the way this is perceived. We are 10 minutes past our time already. I would love to take more questions, but I think at this point we're going to have to call it. There's been much said of value this evening, and I'm grateful to all of you. I want to thank uh, Andy Basevich, David Ellenson, <laughs> Susanna Heschel, <laughs> Jeff Jacoby, and Professor Ephraim Inbar. Thank you very much to you all and to the Elie Wiesel Center for this terrific program tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you everybody.